Tommaso, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to have the possibility to share a discussion with you about what learning analytics uh, is promising in the field of educational research and practice. And um, I'm particularly excited for this presentation because I see that there's a lot of people that I know connected and a lot of colleagues with which I would be more than happy to share ideas and comments and discussions about what I will present. And I'm particularly grateful to Daniel because I was thinking how to use the initial part of my presentation to convince all the people that um, use data in the educational process is useful. And I think Daniel did a great job in this respect. It did a great presentation in which it is very clear why having the power of data is something which is super useful and super relevant for educational policy and practice. Uh, let me share my uh, screen. I hope that everyone is now uh, seeing my presentation. So what I will talk about today is um, learning analytics for improving educational policies and practices, principles and examples. So the idea is that my presentation will be focused on these five main topics. So the first one is to try to introduce the concept of learning analytics. So what we define for learning analytics and to provide a theoretical reference framework for understanding the potential role of this emerging discipline and approach in the field of educational policy. Then I will just um, provide some examples of learning analytics applications, or at least of uh, learning analytics as we define it and apply, apply to some particularly uh, specific educational problems. And then I will make my proposal uh, about uh, what is the policy implication of all these and the policy implication just in brief and in advance is that what we need in our educational systems and educational institutions are people uh, with a certain degree of competencies in analytics and especially we need people who can um, have the role of what we call educational data scientists within schools ministries and agencies. And then I will finish just with a small uh, list of potential research perspectives in this field. So just to set the stage, um, if we want to make a clear definition of what learning analytics is, we can refer to a definition that has been shared in the first international conference of the Society for Learning Analytics Research. And uh, that definition, uh, in my view, is clearly defining the, the key aspects of this approach. That is, it is the measurement collection, analysis and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. Now, this definition is bringing on the table a lot of elements which are relevant. So the first one is that there is some technical activity, which is basically, you know, uh, collecting data, measuring, analyzing, reporting. So all the, the initial part, say, of the learning analytics approach is the one that shares a lot of common points with what, uh, uh, Daniel just you know presented that is there's a technical activity of collecting the data, but then you know there's a specific purpose of this learning analytics approach, which is to use advanced techniques, and not only the ones that we have in the usual toolbox of econometric and statistics to try to understand more, digging into the data, and to understand more about how learning processes are actually happening and which are the factors which are influencing the uh, learning processes. So as I will try to say later, uh, it is something like we need a change. Well, the learning analytics is proposing a change in paradigm. That is a change in the way in which we look at the phenomena that just Daniel illustrated and the way in which you can use the data for trying to empower the specific roles of people who have to make decisions about educational processes and practices. Now, if we accept this approach, uh, this approach in terms of practical way of using data um, can be summarized into four main areas. So the first one is the descriptive analytics. So having insights into the past, which is basically what Daniel very well illustrated in his 
super uh, important presentation. That is, you have a bundle, you have a bunch of data coming from several sources, and then you can use them to describe phenomena that has already happened. And uh, and so you can, you know, describe with a lot of uh, details what happened in a specific area, in a specific field, in a specific country, in a specific discipline, and so on and so forth. But now what learning analytics approach want to promote is the use of this data for at least of the three main areas. So the first one is diagnostic analytics. So to try to understand causal relationships. This is something that actually is very traditional in educational research. I think that in the past 30 years, most of the um, academic debate was about moving from descriptive analysis to more causal analysis, that is to try to understand why some phenomena happen. So for example, uh, one thing is to say that uh, schools in which there are more students coming from disadvantaged backgrounds have lower uh, student test scores. A different thing is to assume and to demonstrate that it is because there are those students that schools have lower tests and not for other causes. And, and so to try you know, to move from describing the events to describing the causes of these events. And this is where basically also economics of education is moving its attention. Um, and all the new you know, econometric techniques try to go into the direction of trying to understand more causes behind the facts. The third part, which is probably the most relevant for the learning analytics approach is the predictive analytics. That is to try to predict and to understand what is going to happen in the next future based on the data you have available today. And so to move from describing what happened and why it happened to try to predict what will happen in the next future. And the reason for moving the attention towards this area is because the fourth approach can be the one of prescriptive analytics. That is, if we don't like what is going to happen in the next future, we can definitely try to activate some factors or activities or interventions to try to avoid the future and try to promote a different future. And so to provide advice about potential outcomes that can come from um, adopting, ad adopting certain interventions. So this is an ambitious goal of the, you know, of this new approach, which is, you know, okay, we, we, we want to understand better what, what happened. We want to understand why it happened, but we want to also to try to have an influence in what is going to happen in the next future. So, um, as a reference framework for understanding how learning analytics is doing that, is a, there's a common point with what Daniel just presented, which is a typical approach in the statistical and the econometric domain, which is to understand from a quantitative viewpoint, so with some limitations, of course, but from you know empirical quantitative analysis, what we call the educational production process. And usually in the statistical and econometric toolbox, we use this instrument called educational production function. That is, you can you know, model with statistical methods, um, the student's results in many domains. And then you can model these results as a function of several factors. So it depends. So the results of students can depend from individual characteristics from school and teachers uh, factors, from the context in which the students live and the school sleeps. And, um, and what presented uh, then before is, is exactly kind of application of uh, this educational production function approach. The usual assumption behind this approach is that we some, somehow know the underlying functional form, that is how the statistical relationships actually are. For example, in most of these models, even in the st sophisticated statistical and econometric approaches, you assume that the um, relationship between a certain factor and the student results is linear. So for example, let's imagine the, the um, variable that uh, Daniel was mentioning, this family income, 
okay? And then you can say, okay, let's, let's look at the statistical relationship between students' result and family income. Then the usual assumption is that there is a linear relationship that is, you know, you have to estimate the coefficient, but once you have estimated the coefficient, the, you know, this is linear along all the distribution. And uh, that's something we don't know, you know, actually. That's, you know, this is an, a, a, an assumption that comes from the theory about how the educational production function is. But from an empirical viewpoint, we are a lot, well, we, we are very ignorant about how actually the, the educational production function is. Learning analytics aims at opening this black box. So to try to investigate more profoundly this relationship between say, the factors that are likely to affect educational achievement and educational achievement itself. And so relaxing all the assumptions about the functional form, so uh, having an approach which is not you know, more based on rigid um, statistical and econometric methods and try to introduce different ways of analyzing, analyzing these data. Um, so for in doing that, there are three major trends that are opening the opportunity of pursuing this objective more substantially. And what I'm saying is not that we have to, you know, forget all the statistical and economic approach. I would say 90% of my research is still using those traditional tools. But today we have three main powerful trends which are going to change the usual way in which we look at the phenomenon. The first one is big data. So uh, as Emanuele was saying before, now we have a lot of administrative data, for example, coming from agencies in different countries in which you have a lot of data about single students, single schools, contexts. So we follow students over time. We have their test scores in several disciplines. We have measures from questionnaires that they have to, to fill for different purposes. So administrative data sets that once upon a time were basically, you know, unaccessible and very, you know, dispersed, today are very much structured, super huge. And this is what we call administrative big data set in the educational domain. The second trend is that Today, um, the sophistication uh, that is possible through artificial intelligence and machine learning is big. <laughs> and we can use new algorithms that have been used for different kinds of problems in, in the scientific and societal domain to be applied to education as well. And especially here in the learning analytics approach, there's a, a wide use of new algorithms coming from the machine learning approaches. That means to have algorithms which are not based on the say usual statistical approach, and they are used. They are based on very you know known parametric and flexible uh, forms that can dig into the data uh, without making strong assumptions about what is the pattern within the data. And the third is the digital learning and digital traces, which is not just forced by the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was happening even before. That is more data are now available through the traces that students leave in their interaction with digital world of education. So for example, once upon a time, the question how much students are studying was a question of, okay, we can you know, assume based on what they repeat. But now you have a lot of information that you can get directly by looking at example, if they download a materials from the website, if they are connected to LMS, and this is just a simple thing, you know, we can, for example, have a, a, an idea about how much time each of you have been connected to this session today. Um, but with simple uh, methods, we can even have information about if you are looking at the screen, if you, you know, with simple methods, we can have an idea about whether you are interested in what you're seeing. I've seen super interesting uh, sensors that can measure, say, your hair rate, uh, uh, your eyes looking at the at the screen, and so on and so forth. So, digitalization of the process is likely to produce much many data than in in 
in the in the past. So these three trends generate or or contribute to generate a lot of data that we didn't have in the past. And so in addition to the traditional kind of data that are super useful as we have demonstrated in the previous session, now we have a, an open opportunity, which is we are we have even more data coming into the scene. And so we have to discuss how we can leverage on this amount of data to try to understand better and to prove better educational processes and, and activities. Now, here I want to enter in this theoretical discussion that is typical when I, you know, when you try to discuss a data-driven approach to understand what is going on in education. Uh, usually, so the kind of approach that Daniel and myself did in, in the past and today is a theory-driven approach. So you first have a theory about how the educational process is happening. And then you try to look at the data and then you validate or not depending on that analysis, your theory. So you have theory, for example, you say, well, I assume, for example, that smaller classes generate better student outcomes than larger classes. And there's a lot of theory about why it should happen. And then you, you make a, a good analysis with statistical and economic techniques and then at the end you say, okay, that's true or not. In, in this case, by the way, it is, you know, uh, quite uncertain, um, just to stay in the example. The, the learning analytics guys usually make the other way around process. That is, they start from data, they say, well, I have a lot of data. Then I analyze them. And then based on what the data reveal about themselves, I will draw theory and validation of these theories. I must confess, I don't like very much the second approach. <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, I, I think that in this field, still theory has a big role. Um, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that the real learning analytics approach, if married with the traditional educational and, uh, evaluation approach, is the one in which we can bring these two worlds a little bit closer. And we can, go towards a world in which we still have a theory without the without which we are doing different things available but it's not educational evaluation so if you if you don't have theory you are not evaluating anything but we must acknowledge in the area of data analysis that we have much more more opportunities that we had in the past so what i'm trying to programming is to try to make this uh, two words a little bit closer than they were in the past and to try to accept the viewpoints each other. Now, just to show, well, I, I can show you a lot of applications of a learning analytics approach, of course. Uh, what I decided to do today is to focus just on, on four recent things. Um, and uh, they are just examples. And for interested people, please write me. I can, I can you know, suggest you a lot of different things that can be used for uh, and can be analyzed. But here today, I want to, to show you examples of application. The first one coming from school family communication through a learning management system. Uh, the second is about predicting students' grade and dropout. Uh, most of my recent activity uh, in, in research is uh, related to the second part. Um, the, the third part is about using log files to understand how students learn and, uh, and the impact of different student learning behaviors on academic results. And then finally, understanding how various school individual factors interact with each other in affecting educational results. So to try to depict how complex can be the educational process. Let's start with the first. So school family communication through a learning management system. This is a paper well, all of these four points are uh, I think there is yeah. one microphone open. Um, yeah, sorry, Tommaso, please, for, uh, for all the... Oh, no, no, you close your microphone, Manuela. Probably somebody closed it. Uh, so please, everybody else but Tommaso should mute the microphone. Thanks. Great. Um, all, all of these four points are illustrated through papers. Uh, this is a paper by Peter Bergman, uh, recently published in education finance and policy. And in this paper, he asked himself, can the use of an LMS 
for school family communication be improved? That is, it, can, are we able to stimulate a wider use of uh, LMS from families? And is is worth it? it is, is it generating better academic results? And this is a typical question that without having, you know, digital data, you can't answer this question in any way, you know? And today you have the opportunity of looking in this. So here, for example, on your left, you have the number of logins into the learning management system by families. And uh, here you have the GPA, so a measure of uh, uh, test score. And what you see here is an interesting thing that is, uh, there's a sharp you know, effect in between say zero and 25 logins in, in an academic year. So families who are not logging into the system actually have students in which the GPA is pretty low, but after the threshold, there's no statistical difference anymore. So you have families who are connecting say 12, 20 times than other families and, um, and still the average GPA of their students is basically the same. But on your right, you have an interesting result, which is Peter uh, Bergman did an experiment. So he randomly choose a group of families and send them an email by saying, well, you can, you know, um, you can access your LMS. These are the credentials success through the LMS, you receive information from the school and so on and so forth. And this random intervention that happened here, you know, in the academic year in November, generated an increase in the number of times that families access the LMS. So the treated families uh, log in two or three times more, no, two or three times more per month than the others. And you know what? He demonstrated that there was a small academic uh, achievement associated with the increase in the number of logins. It can happen because, you know, families are more aware of what the students are doing in the school. It can be because, because the family are, you know, more informed about uh, from teachers through the LMS and so on. But now let's imagine this is a very small and very cheap intervention, which is showing through data that you can access digitally, that families actually interact more with the schools. And, you know, uh, this is eventually generate a small uh, increase in the academic achievement. Second example, this is a paper by uh, Von Nippel and Nofflinger. Um, this is related to higher education. What they are saying is, what they are trying to do is they want to predict if students will drop out from university in the first year. And um, so they, they make a prediction based on data of the students at the beginning of the academic year, they, they predict, is the student going to drop out before the semester, before the academic year starts, then after semester one, then after semester two. Uh, by the way, this is something we are doing uh, quite extensively. No, we are doing a, in a, as an experiment at Polytechnic de Milano. I have a similar paper, but I wanted to use this one. Um, what they are doing is, this is the figure uh, that is summarizing the result. So this line is showing, you know, random uh, prediction, that is prediction which is not able to predict anything. Even before semester one, the researchers are able to predict a certain number, you know, of students who will actually drop out at the end of semester two. After semester one, this information, this prediction, increased quite substantially. And after semester two, they were basically able to predict, say, 80% uh, of students who will drop out. You, you can see that after, you know, uh, semester one, they are able to predict, say, 60%. So this is to say that with available data, and using dynamic, in this case, machine learning data and uh, machine learning techniques, they are able to make prediction about if the students will drop out or not well in advance before the decision. And that's an interesting and super intriguing thing because if you're able to predict correctly that the students will drop out, then 
you can try to make intervention before it happens. And you can try to, you know, help some students that otherwise will, will drop out to avoid this negative outcome. Uh, just to give you a sense of what we are doing with my research group right now, we are trying to use some dynamic data of electronic registers in secondary schools to understand how early we are able to predict the grades the students will obtain at the end of the academic year. And so the idea is that if you know this very well in advance, then you can put in individualized interventions with students who are struggling in certain disciplines or who are more at risk of uh, dropping out or uh, to repeat the year. Um, the third example is the one using log files, that is files that are tracing the way in which students interact with tests to understand learning behaviors and their impact on academic results. Here is a paper uh, by a group of uh, uh, ac academics, one uh, from uh, University of Perugia, Michele is a good friend. And what they are doing is they are, you know, looking at log files, so files in which each student way in responding to solving complex problems are traced. So the student is in front of a computer, has a complex problem in, to, to solve, and the way in which they interact, so they, they try to answer, then they go back, then they correct. So all these interactions with the system are recorded in a log file. And then the researchers pick this very complex data set to try to understand if students have different behaviors in answering these complex uh, problems. And what they show, they, they did a seminar at Invalsi showing these this results. What they show is that they were able to identify 10 Latin classes, 10 different student profiles. So 10 different ways that the students, so 10 different categories the students approach uh, can be uh, classified in. And these 10 different approaches, 10 different, you know, behaviors, these are in the left. And uh, they are able to show that, you know, uh, if, you, if you segment the problem they are going, they, they are solving into exploration behavior, um, knowledge acquisition, knowledge application. So they show that the students do that very differently. And in these 10 classes, what they show then in, on your right is that their scores in the three different domains are different. And so you know how powerful is the information? So if you're able to classify the single students, you say, okay, you are a student that as, a, as an attitude, as a behavior, you belong to the Latin class in nine, and then I can observe how these students in these classes are performing differently in different parts of the test. Well, this is the premise to realize what we call adaptive learning. That is, you can teach differently to these students because you know their behavior in the same problem is very different to the, the behavior that different students are applying. And so instead of basing this on formulating your own hypothesis and your evidence of what you're observing the students, you can use this data, which is there available in the way in which they interact with the computer in solving these problems, and then you can add this information to the, your own experience as a teacher, and then you can empower the way in which you can uh, work with the single students or with the single categories of students. Uh, finally, and this is probably the one which is more related with uh, Daniel's presentation before, is, uh, and sorry for the uh, self-citation here, is a work, but th there's a lot of other works actually here. But uh, this is a work that I realized with some colleagues and here, uh, what we did in this work is to try to show how the factors influencing school performances are not linearly related with performance itself and how they interact in a very complex way. And we use the machine learning algorithm for doing that. What we did is we first estimated the uh, uh, school value added in the way in which Daniel illustrated before. And then we tried to see which factors are associated with school value added. But for doing that, instead of using traditional statistical analysis, we used complex machine learning techniques for doing that. What we discovered is super interesting in my view. So for example, look at this down 
at, the, at this um, uh, down figure. So here, for example, you see it is the value added for the uh, schools based on the proportion of students with special needs. So what you usually do is you put a coefficient there and then you estimate a relationship between the proportion of students with special needs and the school value added or test score. And you assume this is a linear relationship, but it is not. <laughs> so in this case, for example, uh, what you see is there's a very, very, very sharp effect in the, in the small proportion of students with uh, special needs. So you have a high school value added for students without students with special need. There's a very negative linear effect between the proportion of zero and 10% of students with special needs. After this threshold, 10%, the effect is flat. So it doesn't make, make any difference if you have say 10%, or 40% of students with special needs is the same in terms of the effect on school value added. And here is the same, for example, with student truancy. So again, this is the typical variable in the PISA analysis in which you can see, you know, there's a negative effect of student truancy on school value added, okay. But this negative effect is not linear. There's a big effect here after 1.5, it is an index of student truancy, flat for a while, Another big negative effect flat for a while. So it depends a lot if you are here or here in the distribution, you know? And basically, if you are in, in, the, in the index it two, is the same effect you have if you are 1.5 or 2.5. And it is after that that the effect is actually showing. But even more interesting is this figure you have in the, in the top of this figure. That is here, what we did is to show the school value added by looking at the interaction between two variables. So for example, here you have student truancy again, and here you have the proportion of funds the school received from the government. And uh, the more, you know, the, the more colorful effect here in your right half side is the negative effect. So you see that a lot of student truancy is associated with negative school value added. We know that, but at the same level of student truancy, this effect is much more negative for schools which are receiving more funds from the government, wherever they are, you know, public schools which are receiving more funds and, and much lower for schools with lower uh, proportion of, of uh, uh, funds from the government. And again, in some schools with a lot of funds from government, even lower, levels of student truancy are associated with um, uh, lower uh, school value added. So the patterns, as you can see here by these colors, is much less linear than it usually appears in the uh, usual statistical analysis. Now, with that in mind, the message, uh, these are just four examples, but the message is in data, there's a lot of power. In data, there's a lot of information we can try to use, not for the sake of researchers like me, Daniel and Manuele, but for trying to improve the experience of learners, the experience of teachers and the activity of the schools and the future of our kids. But for doing that possible, we need a particular approach. And the approach is the one that we tried with a colleague from Columbia University to, to depict in this small uh, article that was called, you know, uh, towards the educational data scientist as a key actor in schools and higher education institutions. And what we push out as an argument in that paper is we need educational data scientists. Who are they? They are people working in educational systems who have the responsibility to try to connect three traditional actors within the schools that are, you know, the community of teachers, the people who are going every day into the classes, virtual or real, and have the educational experience with the kids, policy and decision makers, the invalsi like people, the Ministry of Education people, people who are in charge, PISA people who are in charge of making, say, decisions, 
and educational researchers who are trying to understand what is going on. Now, what we need is a bunch of people who are able to connect the dots between these three actors to try to activate information because otherwise research will generate a lot of information which is not used because teachers that otherwise can, you know, will we'll put practices that are not evaluated, will not generate data and have to be assessing their effectiveness and decision makers will make decisions on their, you know, opinions or sensations or feelings. The idea is that, that we need people with specific skills that can try to pick the best from these three words, leveraging on data to support decision-making process, to support experienced teachers, to support searchers in opening or so their own eyes. And uh, what we feel is that the kind of competencies that we need for these people are something in the between of computer science, math and statistics, business, business analysis. I'm passionate about this topic because I had the, I would say, uh, honor in the past 10 years of having dialogues with lots of teachers, lots of um, headmasters, a lot of uh, students, a lot of decision makers. And every time when I show this analysis, I do as a researcher, they say, oh, that's fantastic. But who is going to do that in the practical reality of schools? And my answer is, well, you know, we, we need to hire people for that. We need, to, we, we need to have a certain amount of people within the system who are in charge of doing this kind of work. I don't imagine that a, a, a professor of Italian literature will be able to look at the log files of their students, you know, and try to understand what is going on. And I don't understand, I don't want to have statistic people like Patrizia try to understand how to use this data better to, to, to teach uh, poems of uh, Leopardi into the classes. You know, what I need to have is people who are going to get data from both Patrizia and the teacher and to try to say, well, this is what the research is doing. This is what we can tell you about your, your own teachers, your own students, your own reality. And then it's your responsibility to activate this. But without leveraging on the power of data for doing that, we miss an opportunity. I perfectly know that the kind of experience my kids are doing, kids in all the schools of the world are doing, is a great human experience of education. I don't want to substitute this with data. But I know that data can actually help this process. And the kind of information we showed you in these examples are something like can empower your knowledge of what is going on behind the curtain of the educational process. Think, for example, how many times we said, oh, the families which are, you know, with our students are not supporting them enough. And on what is based this is a dialogue you have once a semester with parents, you know. And now you have the power of looking at how many times they are interacting with an LMS, for example. And it is a piece of evidence. It's not substituting your experience. It's not substituting your emotional intelligence in having a dialogue with parents. It is adding information. And it, well, my, my, my argument is, please don't, don't close your eyes in front of this data which is available. And I'm saying this message to you guys because when I do these presentations to uh, my colleagues and statisticians who are so excited about these opportunities of data, I say to them, please don't assume that with your fantastic algorithms and data sets, you are able to understand what is going on every day with my kids at their schools because it's not something that you can just, you know, analyze with your fantastic machine learning algorithms. It's something much more. But it is be, if we put them, these two approaches together, that learning and ideas can become a friend of teachers and schools and not an enemy. Let me just conclude with three titles, which are, the, in my view, the three big topics we as educational systems will have as challenges for the next future. 
to try to apply this method to understand what is going on. The first one is learning loss. So to try to understand what actually happened in these months uh, when students were not able to attend schools regularly. The second is to try to understand the effectiveness of digital learning. I have listed a lot of, how can I say, uh, stupid uh, discussion about, well, digital learning is not good as it is brick and mortar education. That's a, a very stupid way of putting the discussion. I think that what we have to understand is which kind of digital learning is working, which is not working. And by the way, it holds even if we think of the practice we're putting in place into traditional education, in brick and mortar education. And finally, the impact of remedial education. I don't know if I am the only one who thinks that in the next future, we will need to try to contract on learning loss we experienced in the past years that we will need to make a huge investment to remedial education the next weeks and months. But is it going to actually have an effect? Is it effective? Is it effective, for example, uh, and they will conclude with this small example. Oh, no, well, I don't know. Oh, well, yeah, let's do that. So we, we have learned very important people saying that a good idea could be to go to school until the end of June. Is it true? Is it going to work? Well, first of all, is it going to happen? I think it, it's not going to happen if I read carefully the news in the newspapers in the, the past weeks. But even if it's going to happen, are we sure it will be effective? Are we in the conditions to rigorously evaluate whether it, it would be effective? I think we should stop talking about our ideas of what is going to work and try to experiment more rigorously and use data to assess more rigorously what is working and what is actually not working and try to decide for the former instead of the for the latter. Thanks a lot for your attention and thanks for the patience of listening to my presentation. Tommaso, thanks. Thanks a lot for the very intriguing and interesting and fascinating presentation. We still have, I mean, we are perfectly on time more or less. So we got time for questions from the floor. Uh, Lorenzo, Maraviglia, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, it, it's not really a question, but, but it's a contribution to our discussion. Um, I, I am not an academic researcher. I work within a, a public administration in una provin provincia. Okay. Um, provincia. Um, uh, and I, I am an, an enthusiast of uh, data science. Okay. Uh, I think that the problem is that we are not hiring people with the, the skills that uh, you have, uh, um, you have, have il illustrated. And the problem is that we are hiring uh, people in the public administration because uh, now, um, uh, administrations are beginning to recruit again, again people and in the future there will be more resources so um, recruitment policies uh, uh, will uh, will develop and uh, it's a point of uh, it's now or never it's now or never because uh, we are building uh, the public administration of the future and it will be a public administration with traditional skills okay with the uh, traditional bureaucratic profile. And it's a world which will never be able to talk with the world of data science. Because as you said, uh, these skills must be brought within the public administration. It's not, po it's, uh, it's not possible to, uh, to buy these skills uh, outside, okay? You, you can buy this on the market. It, it, up to a certain point, it must be internal to public administration, or there is no, no way, no chance to, uh, to exploit all these uh, new possibilities. That is my opinion, but it's, it's, it's an insider <laughs> point of view. Okay. Uh, thanks, Lorenzo. Tommaso, sorry, there is another. Uh, if you agree, uh, we'll collect some further eventual questions. There is one from Giorgio Monti, please.
we can't hear you. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. It's too, it's too far away. The voice it sounds like. Tommaso, is it just me or you're also having problems? No, no, I'm, I'm listening as it is very, very far from the microphone. I don't yeah. know why. Is it better now? Now it's better, yeah. Okay, okay yes, uh, I, will, I will talk a bit louder. And about, I, was, I also read the, the Peter Bergman work and I was really impressed, but the question I asked myself is, Something like this, do you think it, it will be possible in the short term in Italy? Since what I noticed is that data about children, about electronic register and learning management system are, I mean, they're very, the data are very protected. It's very, diff, it's quite impossible to get them, to, anon to anonymize them and everything. So I would ask if you think it would be something to work with with electronic register that uh, will be, it's possible yeah now. And what, if, if yes, what are the, the, the procedure you need? And if it's not, what do you think should, should be improved in that sense in making this data more available to researchers and university and so on? Uh, Tommaso, I don't see any further questions, so please. Yeah, I will start with the uh, with this two then. So the first one, I totally agree. You know, I um, I know that in the public administrations, as Emanuele uh, presented at the beginning, um, I work quite extensively in several different kinds of uh, public administrations, and I know there is a short shortage of competencies in data science. Um, the reason for that is that. Uh, we, we as a country never invested into hiring people in this area within public administration. I think it is the competence number one that we need, uh, where the number two is digital skills. Um, but, you know, we are training those guys. <laughs> we actually, you know, in the universities and Natali, we are, we are training people in this field. The problem is, who are the conditions to attract them into public administration? And um, it's not something that we will solve uh, during this seminar, but I think, you know, we have several areas in which we need to improve the way in which we hire people within public administrations and schools. It's a matter of compensation. It's a matter of flexibility. It's a matter of uh, enthusiasm. It's a matter of motivation and so on. And um, all these conditions today, well, I had, I tell you a story, I had a very, 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 very good student uh, at a certain point. I have a lot of good students actually, and a lot of good people, uh, young people working with me in this area. Some of, we, some of whom are already even connected to this seminar. But uh, I had a very good student at a certain point and um, I and my people in my research group tell him, told him, oh, why don't you stay with us for say one night, one year and work together on these topics and he said, well, I loved it. I love working with you on these topics. But the problem is um, I have Amazon who is offering me a job position. And uh, the conditions uh, <laughs> are very different, you know? So I think we have passionate people and not all of them value only money. And to be honest, young people today who love these areas are much less interested in money than we are. But they wanna have flexibility, they wanna have motivation, they wanna have the possibility to work with people who are enthusiastically involving them. This is what we have to offer them, in my opinion. About the question by Giorgio, um, since we are recorded, I, I can't say really what I think about the privacy regulation we have in our country. Um, but uh, so I can, I can say, well, it is difficult <laughs> uh, to make a study like the one that Peter Bergman did. And, and more generally, it is difficult to use uh, administrative and, uh, and uh, other data um, at individual level, especially. It's not impossible. 
it's not impossible to to work even to to set experiments it requires a lot of time i'm setting quite quite a, a number of experiments actually um uh, i think Gianluca is also connected and he's the master of uh, realizing experiments uh, in our country education um it's time intensive uh what you need to do is to be in contact with um institutions schools and of course agencies working to help you in your own research what you can do is as peter bergman did is to go to a private provider of electronic registers and say can you just give me the data <laughs> yeah it's not going to happen but but you can start to approach the ministry you can start to say which are the you know idea you have and so on and so forth it is long um but it can happen so I, it is just to say that I want to encourage you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Tommaso. Thanks for the questions. Uh, it's one o'clock, but we could have some extra time because we started slightly later than expected. Uh, so are there other questions? Okay, well Excuse then, me, uh, oh please. Well, may I ask a question? Please, Stefania, please, okay, please, Stefania. Uh, maybe it's a question more for Daniel than for Tommaso. Um, about as far as globalization is uh, concerned, uh, um, I I am not so sure that PISA is not so good to evaluate our um, national system because I I uh, should like to know: Do you think that our student has to be student of the world? or they have to be student of our national uh, context, you know? I mean, now students will not work in uh, their country uh, very often. So I think PISA give you a measure of how the student can um, and, uh, have, I mean, the competencies that allow them to work everywhere. I mean, uh, PISA measure how, uh, how the student uh, can, what the student can do with what uh, they learn at school to be citizens of the world, you know? So I, I'm not sure that you have to be so linked to your uh, tradition. And maybe it's better to be more wide uh, uh, open idea, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I want to know your opinion about, or maybe Tomas also, thank you. Okay, so um, I think uh, students need to be both of those things. They need to be citizens of the world, but they also need to be um, citizens of their local context as well. So um, um, being both global and local citizens. Um, is PISA useful? Yes, as I say, PISA is definitely useful and can tell us things. Um, however, um, the issue I think it is uh, twofold. Firstly, um, we are, we are, of course, cannot just assume that just because uh, OECD says these are the competencies that everybody needs internationally, that that is necessarily the case. That is also a matter for some debate, for some discussion. Um, secondly, um, what I was trying to say is that um, there is a question about how we reach those outcomes as well. And of course, um, the fact that we all want our uh, pupils to become global citizens doesn't mean that we can do that in exactly the same way across different contexts, because um, the cultural context of, say, um, um, East Asia is very different to the cultural context of, say, Europe. So we will have to adapt um, the methods we use, the way we teach, etc., to where we are as a system. Um, for example, um, uh, when Thomas was talking about uh, learning analytics and the use of, uh, and obviously that's connected to the use of digital education, and you rightly say, okay, um, it is simplistic to say uh, in a school building everything is better. Well, um, of course, how far you can go in those things are to do with things like digital infrastructure in your country, um, the skills level in your country, etc. So again, um, you are going to have to say, okay, this is where we want to be, but we are starting here. So those are the interventions we will have to put in place to get there. 
Thank you very much. Daniel, thank you very much for the answer and thanks Stefania for, for the question. Uh, it's uh, five minutes past one. So if there are no further questions, Oh, yeah, Julia. Julia Montefiore. Sorry, I just read it now on the chat. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for the very interesting presentations. Uh, it was, they were really, really interesting. I have a question about um, the role of schools in using data. Um, and I'm connecting to this because of like the increasingly, uh, like the increasing availability of data, of a wide range of data that is increasingly available to schools, not only in Italy, but also in the rest of the world. Now, I was looking for a, a specific paper in Mendeley now to be able to reference it as I was doing my question, but unfortunately I couldn't find it. So I was wondering what you both uh, think about the required Okay, so we know from the literature that data teachers that teachers that are data experts in schools um, are very useful and are very important for schools to really use data. But I've, I've been wondering what what do you think would be the like the minimum uh, like requirements for these experts, like what the minimum knowledge and like skills of these experts to really use data? Uh, because I've been reading literature uh, regarding um, that was saying that. Um, even if data experts struggle a bit with statistics, if they are able to analyze numbers, even though it is not like statistically rigorous, they still can improve instruction because they are able to somehow direct their teaching uh, in a way that is not completely aligned and completely does not completely correspond to what uh, like data like evidence informed teaching would be. But it is still better that what they would do. Uh, based just on intuition or on professional experience. That is not to undermine the, those two last elements, but just to say that. And I was wondering if you have encountered literature like this and what is your specific thoughts about this? Also in the light of that, if we have uh, statistical experts looking at this data, of course, whatever information that is returned to school or in general, whatever information is returned and mediated by an expert is also, uh, like it has a direction, it is not neutral. So of course, the way that we analyze data uh, is never neutral, and schools might be able to do that depending also on the context, content, co connecting to school autonomy and needs that are that need to be met in different kind of contexts. So I'm not sure if my question is clear, but I hope so. And I'm clear. Sure you have an answer for me. Yeah. Who wants? Tommaso, do you want to start? Uh, I have a very um, a strong idea. I would be happy to, to test it. So this is just my idea. But my idea is very simple. Uh, I think that all the teachers should have a very, very basic, super basic knowledge of statistics, say something like a statistic 101 thing or, you know, very, very basic, no more than this. And what, then what they think it is useful is that they, they become able to formulate the right questions about what they, they need to know. And then if I have to, to suggest a policy, I would say every regional uh, office of the Ministry of Education just hire, say, 20 data scientists, put them in the, in the system. And then when teachers have ideas about questions they have uh, to formulate to receive a, a, an answer from that analysis, there are the experts that do that. So I want to know, for example, how many of my students did not uh, attend the classes during um, our digital sessions in the past six months. And I don't, I don't want to have a world in which a professor of uh, uh, literature goes in its own computer and try to understand this information. I want to have a world in which he can formulate, he or she can formulate this question. And then there is a person who is expert in this kind of things, have no idea about our teaching the party, but have an idea about our funding this information. Thanks, Tommaso. I don't know, Daniel, do you want to add something? I, 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 I agree. Um, I think uh, I agree that that basic uh, knowledge of statistics is necessary just so that they know that, that things like confidence intervals, etc., exist. But the idea that we can have um, data experts, and especially data sciences in every school, that is an impossibility. So the idea of indeed kind of central service and clusters that support that seems, uh, seems uh, sensible to me. Yeah, I share the same idea. So, well, thanks everybody for this very interesting plenary session. And thanks, of course, to Ivalsi for organizing and had 
giving us the chance to discuss together. So let's have a one hour, uh, less than one hour break, please. <laughs> My plenary starts at two, so be on time. <laughs> and uh, take care, everybody, and see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you Ciao. very much. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao.